Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, welcome to session seven of our course about the FOMO series of old. Today, we will be talking about Patachara and about Soma. And uh, I know that last time was a little bit theoretical. We talked about Bikuni Vinaya, so today I just wanted to have a session that's very uh, very relaxing and also inspiring, hopefully, because next time again we are talking about the nuns who undertake ascetic practices. So we'll talk about ascetic practices, which will again be a little bit theoretical, and I hope that today will just be a relaxing uh, and uh, inspiring session for everyone. And a few people have told me that they uh, have other appointments today, so I think we don't need to have we don't need to wait for others today and we will just chant the Namotasa and then I will show you what we are doing today. And if you want, uh, please feel free to chant along. Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami So I will share my screen and show you what we are doing. Today, as I mentioned, we will talk about Patachara and about Soma. And uh, we will start by, uh, with, we will start with Patachara, of course, and have a look at her and her students in the Tirigata. So we will look at a lot of poems. And I think what we can see there is a very beautiful tradition of the early Bhikkhunis that is very unique to the Bhikkhuni Sangha that the monks didn't, apparently didn't do or didn't do as much. So something that we can't really find in the Theragata, the monks verses. Uh, a very unique way to uh, pay homage to a teacher and to express gratitude for a teacher. And we will also see some of Patachara's um, teachings there because we don't have anything, any suttas preserved of Patachara where she gives um, teachings. And then we will have a look at Soma, Soma Bikuni in the Bikuni Samyutta, and we will also look at one of the Apadana stories of Soma in the Sanskrit Avadana Shataka. And um, when we read the Apadana story, then we will see that there is a connection between Soma and Patachara, not in the Pali tradition, but in non-Pali traditions, um, we can very clearly see that um, there is a connection between the two, which is why I put them together in today's session. But let's start with Patachara first. And Patachara, of course, is associated uh, in most of the Buddhist traditions with the person foremost in memorizing Vinaya or keeping Vinaya. So she has a Vinaya quality. In the Pali tradition, uh, she is foremost uh, among the nuns who memorize the text on monastic training. In the Chinese Ekotara Agama, she is the foremost of those who keep the Vinaya. Um, and in um, the Independent Sutta T126, she is the one who is foremost among the bhikkhunis who uh, are of few wishes, no moderation, and follow the ascetic practices. So this is not a vinya quality. This is usually the quality that is ascribed to Kisa Gotami. And in T126, Kisa Gotami is actually the one who is keeping vinya. So it seems that Patachara and Kisa Gotami have swap places in T126. And uh, in, our session, in our second session, when we uh, already studied all those lists in very much detail, we saw that T126 has some uh, very unusual features. It's a little bit late. And um, many things seem to um, deviate a little bit from the other more established traditions. So T126 T1, seems to be a little bit less well-preserved than other texts. 
And for that reason, I think um, Patachara and Kisa Gotami have swapped places in that sutta. But generally, Patachara is very closely associated with um, Vinaya practice. And that's very interesting because um, when we actually look at the Bhikkhuni Vinayas in all the schools, then we see that Patachara actually doesn't appear there at all. She is not mentioned even one single time in any of the Bhikkhuni Vinayas. Um, and for that reason, we are not studying Bhikkhuni Vinaya today, even though this is her foremost quality, because she does not appear in those texts. But instead, she does appear many, many times in the Terigata. She seems to be the most popular nun there. Uh, there are lots and lots of uh, students of hers who uh, reference her teachings and who talk about her, the gratitude they have for her. So that is what we are going to look at today. And uh, before we do that, um, I will just give a brief introduction to her life story. I think most people will be familiar with it because it's such a striking story. Um, but briefly, just to recap, um, she came from a very wealthy family. She grew up uh, well protected, um, but then she fell in love with one of the servants and they ran away together and she lived uh, in a very poor village together with that man. And then uh, eventually she gave birth to a son um, on the road back uh, to her family house. But um, because she gave birth on the road, she didn't continue going to her family. She returned back to the village. But when she was pregnant a second time, she again tried to reach her family. Um, and again, she went into labor on the way. And her husband, who was with her, tried to build a shelter, but he uh, got bitten by a snake and died. So she had to give birth alone. Um, and uh, when she found that her husband was dead, she decided to continue on to her family in Savati, her parents and her siblings. Uh, and she had to cross a river that uh, was flooding at that time because there had been a storm in the night when she gave birth. And uh, so she, carried, she, she couldn't carry both of her children across. She carried the baby first, left it on the other bank and went back to get the other child. Uh, and then um, a bird of prey came and carried the baby away and she started screaming to scare the bird away. But the other son thought that she was calling him and he went into the river and he drowned. So she lost both her children at the same time and her husband. And then um, somebody, when she was on the way to Savati, somebody told her that also her parents and her siblings had all died in the storm in the previous night. So she lost her entire family uh, at the same time and she was overcome with grief and she, went, she, she was mentally deranged and went pretty mad and was just wandering around uh, in this very deranged state. And eventually she came to the Buddha and the Buddha taught her and she um, recovered and ordained and became an Arahant. And because of that very unique life story, because of that extremely deep suffering and despair that she went through, um, she became a, an outstanding teacher and she became somebody who was extremely compassionate towards other women who were suffering, especially towards other women who had lost family members, especially uh, children. And because of that uh, unique experience, that deep trauma that she went through, uh, she had unique abilities as a teacher and is therefore celebrated uh, much more than any other nun in the Terigata. And these are the poems that we are going to look at now. And I've put them in a spreadsheet because it's much easier to compare. So um, let me share that now. And here it is. Uh, I think you should be able to see that now. So we are going to look at seven poems today that all reference Patachara. Um, and I've split that into two groups because they all reference Patachara. I think they're all expressions of their gratitude and of their respect towards Patachara, but uh, the content of the suttas is somewhat different and their way of paying respect is somewhat different. So I've split it into two groups and here we have four points first and then the other four are down here. The other three together with Patachara are down here. And uh, I want to read Patachara's poem first and then um, 
see how it goes. So Patachara's poem is Terigata 5.10. Um, so it has five verses and it goes as follows. Plowing the fields, sowing seeds in the ground, supporting partners and children, young men acquire wealth. I am accomplished in ethics and do the teacher's bidding, being neither lazy nor restless. Why then do I not achieve quenching? Having washed my feet, I took note of the water, seeing the foot washing water flowing from high ground to low. My mind became serene like a fine thoroughbred steed. Then taking a lamp, I entered my dwelling, inspected the bed and sat on my cot. Then grabbing the pin, I drew out the wick. The liberation of my heart was like the quenching of, a lamp, of the lamp. So Patachara begins her poem with this first stanza. That's a very, very unusual image. Uh, it's not quite clear, like it's not immediately clear how that relates to Buddhist practice, where she talks about the young men um, doing agricultural work and supporting their families by doing that. And we can see this is Panchasujato's translation here, because he says uh, he, he is well known for making gender neutral translations. So he's saying partners and children, where other translators often say wives and children. So the giveaway that this is Panchasujato's translation. Anyway, the poem starts with this um, agricultural image um, that is somewhat unusual. Um, but very striking, very recognizable, very memorable. And from there, she goes on to tell her own story. She doesn't tell her life story. She doesn't go into any detail about what happened to her family or anything that happened before her, um, her ordination as a bhikkhuni. Um, but here it, it talks about um, how she is not yet enlightened. She's wondering why can't she get enlightened? Uh, and then she tells the story of her enlightenment um, she sees the foot washing water uh, flowing away and that triggers an insight into impermanence and into the unreliability of life. And uh, that then triggers her full awakening, her arahanship. So um, we see a few um, memorable phrases that are fairly unique to Patachara's poem that are not that much found in other poems in the Terigata. The first one is this agricultural image and especially the young men who acquire wealth in that way. And then the, uh, the I've put them in bold here, the expression, I do the teacher's bidding and the expression or, or the image of washing one's feet and of that, uh, that act, um, then triggering her full enlightenment. These are things that are fairly unique to Patachara, especially the first one and the third one. Doing the teacher's bidding does occur elsewhere a little bit, but the other two are fairly um, unique to Patachara. And this is something that we will see over and over uh, picked up in the poems of her students. And that they take up these uh, striking um, images that um, identify with uh, Patachara and Patachara's poem that are fairly unique to Patachara and her poem. And they play around with it a little bit. They introduce their own take on, on the uh, similes. They introduce their own um, uh, like they play around, they, they introduce on variances. And uh, by doing that, I think this is a way for them to immediately evoke Patachara's poem, because as we know, this was an oral tradition. People would have memorized Patachara's poem. So by using very similar imagery, uh, people would immediately make the connection to Patachara. So this is a way of uh, calling her to mind, remembering her, paying respect to her. And also I think of, um, showing gratitude to the teacher who helped them to attain full awakening. And also obviously a way to uh, make sure that her poems and her teachings aren't forgotten. So once her students become teachers in their own right and teach their own students, um, they make sure that they pass on Patachara's knowledge to the next generations and through the lineages of Bikunis from teachers to students. And that is something that is very unique to the Bikuni, uh, to, to the Bikuni um, tradition that we don't really see, uh, definitely we don't see it to the same extent in the Teragata. We see it occasionally for other teachers also in the Teragata. We've mentioned it a little bit when we talked about Kema. 
there was a similar uh, incident in Kia, uh, or similar um, similar things happening with Kema and her students. But for Patachari, it's so much more obvious that uh, I wanted to talk about it today. And now I, I just want to read the uh, first poem of her students, and then we we can see much better um, how that takes place, how they're playing around with Patachara's poem. So Patachara was a very accomplished teacher. She had many, many students. And here now we see a group of 30 students. And they say, taking a pestle, young men pound corn, supporting partners and children, young men acquire wealth. So we see it, there's a clear reference to Patachara's verse, but they are playing around with it a little bit. They're using also agricultural imagery, but in a, in, in a different way, taking a pestle, young men pound corn, uh, is obviously not exactly the same as plowing the fields, but the same general image. So straight from the start, with the first center of their poem, they um, evoke Hatachara's poem and make that mental connection. And that would have been a lot more striking, of course, in an oral tradition where people have actually memorized all those poems. So the connection is much more immediate. And they continue, do the Buddha's bidding, after which you will not regret having quickly washed your feet, sit in a discreet place to meditate, devoted to serenity of heart, do the Buddha's bidding. So here we have an instruction preserved directly from Patachara that she gave to the 30 students. Uh, and we again see this um, reference to doing the Buddha's bidding and also the reference to washing one's feet. And we know that washing one's feet for Patachara that triggered her full awakening. For the 30 students, it doesn't really trigger their full awakening, but they incorporate that imagery like um, into their poem as a way to celebrate the full enlightenment of their teacher. Because in their own story, washing the feet isn't really that important. But for Patachara, it was really important. So the 30 students uh, continue. After hearing her words, the instructions of Patachara, they washed their feet and retired to a discreet place, devoted to serenity of heart, they did the Buddha's bidding. In the first watch of the night, they recollected their past lives. In the middle watch of the night, they purified their clairvoyance. In the last watch of the night, they shattered the mass of darkness. They rose and paid homage at, at her feet. We have done your bidding. We shall abide honoring you as the 30 gods honor Indra, undefeated in battle, masters of the three knowledges. We are free of defilements. So now, um, here they make a clear connection with Patachara, they mention her name. In the beginning, they only evoked her poems, so it was um, not an explicit connection, but here now they make the connection explicit, very open, that Patachara is their teacher. Um, and then they again mirror her poem by now telling their own story of enlightenment in the same way that Patachara told her story of enlightenment. And uh, then in the last stanza, they, um, they introduce an image of their own, and they say, uh, we will abide honoring you as the 30 gods honor Indra. So again, they're giving a direct expression to the respect that they want to show to Patachara and that they are showing with this poem. And this simile of the 30 gods on honoring Indra, that's of course a reference to the heaven of the 33 gods, uh, of which Indra is the, the god king. And the 30 gods obviously are um, sort of um, people who pay respect to Indra, who are not quite on the same level as Indra. And so we have 30 students here paying respect to Patachara and the number 30, of course, is why they, they select uh, this image of the 30 gods that honor Indra. So um, this is the uh, poem of the 30 students. We see how they pick up Patachara's images and play with them and use them to construct their own poems uh, while at the same time, of course, um, invoking Patachara uh, and her poem. So I think this is a clear sign of them, of them wanting to pay respect with the poem that they construct here. Yeah. And then we uh, have a look at Uttara. Um, Uttara is another student of Patachara, and she obviously was uh, familiar both with the poem of the 30 students and with Patachara's own poem. And she's playing around with both. And her poem is in Terikata 7, so it has seven stanzas. Uh, and it goes as follows. Taking a pestle, young men pound corn. Supporting partners and children, young men acquire wealth. 
Work at the Buddha's bidding, after which you'll not regret. Having quickly washed your feet, sit in a discreet place to meditate. Establish the mind unified and serene. Examine conditions as other as not self, not, not as self. After hearing her words, the instructions of Patachara, I washed my feet and retired to a discreet place. In the first watch of the night, I recollected my past lives. In the middle watch of the night, I purified my clairvoyance. In the last watch of the night, I shattered the mass of darkness. I rose up, master of the three knowledges. Your bidding has been done. I shall abide honoring you as the 30 gods honor Sakka. Undefeated in battle, master of the three knowledges, I am free of defilement. So here again, Uttara starts out with the same imagery. She's copying the 30 students. And then um, playing around a little bit with the wording. She doesn't say do the Buddha's bidding. She says work at the Buddha's bidding. But still, I mean, the, the reference is quite clear. Then we have an extra stanza where she preserves a little more of Patachara's teaching. And to me, that's very beautiful because as I mentioned, we don't have that much of Patachara. We don't have any suttas. And she also doesn't appear in the Vinaya. So it's beautiful to have these small glimpses. And Patachara here teaches her about Samatha and Vipassana, so a serenity of mind and then um, inside practices, uh, so non-self practices. And then again, very, very similar to the 30 students, she washes, she hears the instructions, washes her feet, and then uh, they um, goes through the different stages in the three watches of the night. Uh, and again, in the last verse, she um, says that she pays respect to Patachara. Um, and I think, um, because, and, and she again uses the simile of the 30 gods that honor Saka. So Saka is another name for Indra. This is the same person, Saka and Indra, the same uh, god king or king of gods. And, but um, because she's only one person, she isn't 30 people. That's why I think it's more likely that the 30 students introduced that, uh, that image and that Uttara copied it from them. Um, and not the other way around. But clearly, I mean, clearly her poem is a, a close uh, match with the 30 students. So clearly she was aware of their poem. Uh, and we see she has seven stanzas. Uh, and, and the reason for that is, now, is uh, that she has this extra bit here about Patachara's teaching and that her stanzas are broken up differently from the 30 students. So her, st her stanzas are shorter. That's why she has more. But the actual content is very, very similar. And then we also have Visaka here. Visaka only has one stanza and her poem goes as follows. Fulfill the Buddha's instructions after which you'll not regret. Having quickly washed your feet, sit in a discreet place to meditate. So she doesn't mention Patachara at all. So we can't actually be 100% sure that um, she is a student of Patachara, but her poem is so similar, she clearly invokes uh, Patachara's imagery clearly. She talks about washing one's feet, and um, it's basically a copy of the other poems here. So I think it's very likely that she is referencing the other students, and very likely that she also is a student. So here in this first group of poems, um, we see that the uh, that her students pay respect to Patachara by. Um, playing around with Patachara's poem and by playing around with Patachara's imagery. Uh, and in the next group of poems that we're going to look at now, I think they're also paying respect to Patachara, but they're doing it differently. They're doing it by paying respect or by incorporating Patachara's life story into their poems and by incorporating Patachara's teachings into their poems. So I've just... Uh, copied Patachara's poem again here for reference, but I'm not going to go through it again. And we will start with Chanda, Chanda's poem. And Chanda says, I used to be in a sorry state. As a childless widow, bereft of friends or relatives, I got neither food nor clothes. I took a bowl and a staff and went begging from family to family. For seven years, I wandered, burned by heat and cold. Then I saw a nun receiving food and drink. Approaching her, I said, sent me forth to homelessness. Out of compassion for me, Patachara gave me the going forth. Then having advised me, she urged me on to the ultimate goal. 
After hearing her words, I did her bidding. The lady's advice was not in vain. Master of the three knowledges, I am free of defilement. So here Chanda um, tells us her own life story. Um, and she's going through a very similar situation to Patachara. She doesn't have children, either she lost her children or she never had children. We don't actually know that. But she's a widow, she lost her husband. And it seems she lost, also lost her entire family. Uh, and uh, as she mentioned, she also uh, was wandering around. She had no place to go. Uh, for seven years, she was in a really very desperate situation. And then she saw Patachara and uh, saw that she received uh, food. And that was her reason for going forth. So she didn't have a genuine spiritual vocation. She just wanted to get some food and maybe just wanted to have a place to stay. Uh, and out of compassion, Patachara gives her the going forth anyway, even though, I mean, it must have been clear to her that Chanda doesn't have a proper spiritual vocation. She's not interested in uh, doing spiritual practices, but still Patachara out of compassion because she relates to her life story and because she can deeply uh, profoundly understand what she's going through. She's giving her the going forth. And uh, she's also a, because she can relate to her, she's also able to give teachings to Chanda so that Chanda eventually um, does make progress on the path and does become an Arahant. So it, it's quite an amazing teaching ability on the part of Patachara that she's able to teach Chanda who is not actually in the, in the beginning is, is not actually interested at all. And I think that's because uh, she's able to deeply, deeply empathize with uh, the situation that Chanda is going through. Um, so she's able to be a very effective teacher in, in this instance. And again, um, the poem ends with the words, master of the three knowledges, I am free of defilement, in the same way that the other students have ended their poems. So I think she's again a little bit making a reference to the other poems, at least in her very last stanza. Um, and then Patachara, uh, there's another um, poem of 500 of her students. Uh, so Patachar obviously was very, very popular, like she had a very large following. Uh, and um, like according to, 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 this, um, to this testimony here, she had a following that was as large as Mahapajapati's with her 500 women. So clearly she was a very popular teacher. And here we have a much longer teaching from Patachara, and that goes as follows. Patachara says, he whose past you do not know, not whence he came, nor where he went. Though he came from who knows where, you mourn that being, crying, O oh my son. But one whose past you do know, whence they came or where they went, that one you do not lament. Such is the nature of living creatures. And as he came, he left without leave. He must have come from somewhere and stayed who knows how many days. He left from here by one road, he will go from there by another. Departing with the form of a human, he will go on transmigrating. As he came, so he went. Why cry over that? Oh, for you have plucked the dart from me, so hard to see hidden in the heart. You've swept away the grief for my son, in which I once was mired. Today I've plucked the dart, I'm hungerless, extinguished. I go for refuge to that sage, the Buddha, to his teaching and to the Sangha. So, um, we have Patachara teaching uh, four stanzas about the loss of children. And then the 500 students um, understand her teaching and are able to attain arahanship. So again, we see uh, Patachara's life story, making her uniquely qualified to teach other women who also have lost children or have lost family members. And she's able to find the right words. Uh, she knows what will help those women and what will um, help them to emerge from the grief and uh, use that skillfully to attain insight into the, the round of samsara and to eventually attain arahanship. And finally, we have the poem of Kisa Gotami. Uh, Kisa Gotami's poem is in the Terikata tenth, so it has 10 stanzas. I've only um, put three here, the three that refer to Patachara. And for Kisa Gotami, we don't really know if she was a student of Patachara or just maybe a friend, or if she was just somebody who admired Patachara. But what Kisa Gotami does in her poem is she incorporates uh, life stories of other nuns, Patachara, 
And probably another one, probably the other one is um, an nun called Vasethi. Um, but for Patachari, the connection is much more obvious. And so she, um, she uh, references their stories to illustrate the points of how much suffering women have to go through um, in samsara and how um, that insight then triggers her full awakening. So in that way, Patachara's story was very helpful to Kisa Gotami. I mean, Kisa Gotami also lost a child. Um, so for that reason, probably Patachara was very inspiring to her. And maybe she was a teacher or maybe she was just a nun that she admired. And so uh, Kisa Gotami's poem goes as, as follows. I was on the road and nearing childbirth. When I saw my husband dead, I gave birth there on the road before I'd reached my own home. My two children have died and on the road, my husband lies dead. Oh, woe is me. Mother, father and brother, all burning up on the same fire. So that is clearly Patachara's story, even though Patachara's name is not mentioned. That's very clearly not Kisa Gotami's story um, of her own because Kisa Gotami's husband wasn't dead and her family also wasn't dead. Only her, her, her child died. And now we have here a stanza preserve, which seems to be the Buddha's instruction to Patachara, which uh, was able to extract Patachara from her grief and uh, restore her sanity. So that's very interesting to find it in, not in Patachara's own poem, but to find it in Kisa Gotami's poem. And the Buddha says to her, oh, woe is you whose family is lost. Your suffering has no measure. You have been shedding tears for many thousands of lives. So the Buddha shows her the bigger picture and that the death of her son isn't unique. And that this is something that will continue on and on in, in samsara unless she extracts herself from that. So he is showing her a bigger picture and um, removing Patachara from that state of grief that she is locked in. And probably his teaching was longer. Maybe this is the short version or just maybe the beginning of a teaching here that is preserved in Kisa Gotami's verses. So here in, in the second group of students, I think what we're seeing here is um, how the life story of Patachara was extremely helpful for her as a teacher and how students celebrate this teaching ability with their poems. So uh, I think all of these students use their poems as a way to express respect towards Patachara and to express their gratitude and to preserve her teachings for later generations. And as I mentioned, this is something that is very unique to the Bikuni poems. And I think that is something that we should um, you know, make conscious and we should actively um, um, rejoice in and celebrate because we have so little that is uh, left from the early Bikunis that you know, these small things that make them very unique are things that we should really welcome and really, uh, really celebrate. So um, now I'm going back to my other um, document and that is here. Um, and before we move on to Soma, I will just very briefly show you a small extract from Patachara's Apadana. Um, this is the story that connects Patachara with Soma. And this is the story of how Patachara was named the foremost nun in keeping, in remembering Vinaya. And she says here, then I learned the whole discipline in the all-seeing one's presence. I recited it for him correctly in every detail. The victor, pleased by my virtue, then placed me in that foremost place. Patachars alone, foremost of those who follow discipline. So um, what seems to have happened is that um, the Buddha recited the, uh, the, the Bhikkhuni Vinaya to her and she memorized it and recited it back to him correctly in every detail. And the Buddha obviously was happy by her um, amazing ability for recall and then uh, put her in the place for most of those who memorize discipline. So here in this text, it says follow discipline, but the Pali is actually Vinaya Darinang. And Vinaya Darinang means somebody who remembers the Vinaya. Um, but I don't want, this is someone else's translation, so I didn't want to change the wording. And I thought I'd just mention it here. Um, so this story is the one that connects Patachara with Soma's story. And so now we are moving on to Soma, our second theory for today. And Soma theory is very interesting because Soma um, 
I mean, I, I'm assuming most people here will be familiar with Soma. Soma has a poem, uh, sorry, has a sutta in the Bikuni Samyutta. And she's the one who is very, very outspoken about gender equality and who refutes the wrong view uh, that there are, um, that gender differences have any um, impact on the monastic life or the monastic path and the abilities of women. So um, nowadays, Soma is very popular, but it seems that uh, throughout the ages, um, that wasn't very popular. So her, her, her sutta is well attested across the Pali and the Chinese traditions, um, but she's a little bit sidelined by later traditions. In the Pali, she's not even a foremost nun. She's not found in the list. In the other traditions, uh, Chinese and Sanskrit traditions, she is a foremost nun, but her, her character isn't very well developed. Um, and there's a lot of variances uh, in, her, uh, in, in how, she, how she is conceptualized as a nun. So uh, let's look at that a little bit now. And in the Ekotara Agama, she is the nun who is foremost for, uh, of those who have compassion for living beings who have not yet reached the path. In T126, she is the one who is foremost among uh, those who undertake what should be practiced and who easily attains the divine eye. And usually the nun who uh, is the foremost in the divine eye is Sakula. So again, here, there seems to be a little bit of a corruption or a confusion in T126. And in the Sanskrit Avadana Shataka, she is the foremost of those nuns who have heard much and among those who remember what they have heard. So we can see she has completely different qualities in all of these traditions. So again, her character isn't well-defined and people attach random things to her in the different traditions. And also this doesn't really refer to the sutta that is preserved of her in Pali and in two Chinese versions. So clearly the sutta wasn't, like, wasn't very popular and there wasn't really a link made between her foremost qualities and that sutta. So um, let's briefly read the sutta. It's a very short sutta. Um, I'll be reading this time from the Pali version of the sutta. If you recall, we have read uh, Sutta from the Bhikkhuni Samyutta already when we talked about um, um, Upalavana. And that time we read a Chinese version, so I'm thinking it's good to mix it up a little bit and look at the Pali version this time. And I'm using Bantu Sutra's translation. And the Sutta goes as follows. At Savati, then the nun Soma robed up in the morning and taking her bowl and robe, entered Savati for arms. She wandered for alms in Savati. After the meal, on her return from alms round, she went to the dark forest, the Andavana, plunged deep into it and sat at the root of a tree for the day's meditation. I'm sorry, the, we just lost electricity here, so I'm assuming you can see it's very dark. I'm very dark. Hopefully you can still see me. And hopefully electricity will come back soon because if it doesn't come back within the next 10 minutes, my internet will cut out. Just to warn you, but let's hope that um, electricity will come back soon. And maybe I should set up a lamp so you can see me. So hopefully that works. Um, anyway, let's continue with this sutta. Sorry about that. Um, then Mara the Wicked, wanting to make the nun Soma fear fear, terror, and good thumbs, wanting to make her fall away from immersion, from Tamadi, went up to her and addressed her in verse. Ah, very good electricity is back. Um, that states very challenging. It is for the sages to attain. It is not possible for a woman with her two-fingered wisdom. Then the nun Soma thought, who's speaking this verse? A human or a non-human? Then she thought, this is Mara the wicked, wanting to make me feel fear, terror and goosebumps, wanting to make me fall away from immersion. Then Soma, knowing that this was Mara the wicked, replied to him in verse, what difference does womanhood make when the mind is serene and knowledge is present as you rightly discern the Dhamma? Surely someone who might think, I am a woman or I am a man or I am anything at all, 
is fit for Mara to address. Then Mara thinking, Mara the wicked thinking, the nun Soma knows me, miserable and sad, vanished right there. So here we have the sutta that I think this is the sutta in the among the early texts. This is the sutta that most clearly states that there is no gender difference uh, between men and women when it comes to spiritual uh, ability, and we clearly see that that view that uh, women are somewhat uh, somewhat inferior is put into Mara's mouth. So that is clearly uh, marked to be a wrong view. Uh, like it couldn't be clearer. Uh, than putting it into Mara's mouth. And Soma also very clearly states, if you think in gender categories at all, if you think like I'm a woman, I'm a man, or I, I'm anything at all, I'm this or that gender or whatever, that way of thinking alone uh, means somebody is under the sway of defilement, under the sway of wrong, wrong view. That is somebody who Mara can influence because of uh, the wrong view, because of the defilements. Um, so um, very clearly here, um, thinking in gender categories is, uh, is uh, shown up to be a wrong view. Um, and of course, this kind of sutta is completely in line with the way of thinking in the early Buddhist texts, where uh, we don't really see much gender discrimination. But uh, as we have seen over the course of the last few weeks, um, the situation changed uh, over the next uh, decades and centuries after the Buddha's passing and uh, gender hierarchies became introduced into Buddhism and the Buddhist Sangha. So this kind of sutta, these kind of sutta, especially this sutta, became, must have become very challenging for later tradition. And I think that is probably the reason why Soma uh, was buried a little bit by tradition, why in the Pali she is not a foremost nun. Uh, and uh, also in the Pali tradition, she only has a very generic Apadana story. She's not a developed character at all. She doesn't have any specific um, features. Her story is not in any way remarkable. Um, and in the Chinese and Sanskrit versions, she is a foremost nun, but she has so many different qualities that, again, it doesn't seem likely that she had a well-defined character. Um, and that's kind of interesting because we have seen, for example, with Kema, Kema was teaching King Pasenadi in the early sources, and that got redefined into her teaching the queen. And with Upalavana, she was, uh, was very self-confidently telling uh, of her psychic powers, of her great uh, attainments, and how uh, no man could possibly do anything to her. And that was redefined in later tradition. Um, and she became the one who was... Uh, over and over, like sexually harassed, sexually assaulted, raped, and so on. So in all those cases, the later tradition engaged with their stories and uh, swapped them around and sort of made them more palatable to the later way of thinking. Uh, but in Soma's case, um, I think her sutta is so challenging, it's really difficult to redefine this, and therefore she was just um, ignored and forgotten and uh, buried as much as possible. Um, so, yeah, in Soma's case, there was no re redefinition of that at all. She was just forgotten. Um, and um, so the last thing I want to look at uh, with you today is the Avadana story that she has in Sanskrit. Um, and um, there is a translation. Uh, it's a very old translation, more than 100 years old. We have seen that already when we read Kema's uh, story there in that Apadana, and uh, the um, translation is into French, uh, like last time when we read Kema's story. So I'm going to show you the French and going to um, sort of summarize the, the story in English. So um, let's look at that. So you should be able to see that now. This is Thomas Apadana story number 74. Um, and the Suda, uh, the, 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 not Suda, the Apadana, the story begins uh, with the Buddha being in Savati in Jita's Grove in Anapatinika's park. And in Savati, there was a rich Brahmin and he was very knowledgeable. He had mastered the three Vedas and all the accompanying material. And he taught 500 young Brahmins. 
And uh, he got married, he had a daughter, uh, the daughter was very beautiful and uh, complete in all her um, faculties and all her body parts. And they celebrated her arrival and they called her Soma, named her Soma after the moon. And in due course, Soma grew up. And when she was grown, she was very knowledgeable. She was very decisive, she was careful, she was active. And she was extreme, she had very good memory and she could remember everything that she heard. So when her father taught the mantras to his 500 students, she had to hear them only one time and she could already remember them. And when she heard the, the Shastras, she could give explanations from beginning to the end. So, so she was extremely knowledgeable. And her, her reputation, her glory, her reputation spread uh, throughout Savati, around in Savati. And uh, every day, non-Buddhist spiritual people um, came to her to, to debate with her about these points, um, about certain points. And then when the Buddha uh, had attained full awakening, he came to Savati and all the spiritual people um, then uh, turned towards him and all went to him. And when they no longer came to Soma, then Soma asked her servants, why aren't they coming anymore? And the servants told her that the omniscient Buddha has now arrived and they're all going there. And when she heard the word Buddha, she had goosebumps all over her body. So she had a, obviously some past life Kamaha and um, she uh, had a very strong, joyful reaction. And she went to the Buddha straight away and paid respect. And the Buddha, um, um, read her mind and um, saw her character and gave her teaching in such a way that she became a stream enterer, she ordained, she became an arahant. And then uh, one day the Buddha told the bhikkhus that they should recite Patimokkha, so the monastic code, um, every half month. And then Mahapachapati said to the Buddha, please uh, teach us the Patimokkha. And the Buddha said, you know, Buddhas cannot teach the Patimokkha unless there's somebody in the assembly who can remember it the first time that they hear it so that the Buddha doesn't have to repeat it over and over. And only under this condition will I be able to um, teach. And then Soma gets up and uh, um, makes Anjali to the Buddha and uh, says to the Buddha, um, please teach the Patimokkha. I will remember it after the first time. And then the Buddha teaches and she remembers it after the first time. And then the Buddha says to the bhikkhus, because she is the foremost of the bhikkhunis who have heard much and who remember what they have heard. And now there's a past life story, but I think we are going to leave that out because it's a very generic story. But here uh, we clearly see uh, the connection between Soma's story and between um, Patachara's story. So it's the, sa the same story. The, the Buddha recites Patimokkha and they remember it at the first time. And then the Buddha puts them in the foremost place. The only thing is that for Patachari, he puts her in the foremost place of those who memorize Vinaya. So it fits the story very well. But for Soma, um, he, she's put into the foremost place among those who have heard much and who remember what they have heard. And that's a quality that um, appears elsewhere in the canon uh, also. And usually that means that that refers to somebody who, who knows a lot of Dhamma not Vinaya necess uh, necessarily. So it's a little bit odd here to see that. Uh, and I think the reason for, for that is because, um, because Patachara's character is very well-defined and she has a very unique story and she's associated with Vinaya in all the various traditions. Um, so we've seen that in a Chinese text and we've seen it in, in, in the Pali text. Um, so we can't actually assign that quality to Soma. So they have to assign a quality that is somewhat similar, that, that sort of fits, but doesn't quite properly fit. And that, that I think that shows us that this story again is a composite story. And they put uh, things together that uh, originally belonged to other people, such as, I, I think it's likely that this story belonged to Patachara, uh, because obviously this is a, a Vinya text that they're talking about, and that it was later attributed to Soma to make a nice story around, uh, around that character. And that's something that happens very frequently in early texts 
both for the bhikkhus and for the bhikkhunis, that there are stories that are floating around and they're very popular and somebody does something that's amazing and that people admire. And then that story gets reduplicated and gets attached to several different people. So that, that uh, happens quite frequently also to the monks. And we will see that again, I think in, in two weeks when we talk about Badakunda Lakesa and her story also gets um, attached to various other people because her story also is very unique and um, became very popular. So um, this is all I have prepared for today. Uh, and to recap what we did today, we uh, first had a look at different poems and we saw a tradition that is unique to Bikunis. Uh, and I, that I want to um, make known more and that, that I think we should celebrate more, which is the, the way of paying respect to a respected teacher uh, through, um, through poetry, through making poems and through preserving their teachings in the form of, uh, of poems. And then we compared uh, Patachar's story with Soma. Soma, of course, uh, is very famous nowadays for being so outspoken about gender equality. Um, but it seems that uh, in certain points of, his, of Buddhist history, she wasn't very popular and she doesn't have a properly defined character, uh, a well-defined character in um, the period of time when the Apadanas were created. So she's a little bit sidelined by tradition for being so outspoken about gender equality. Um, and uh, with that, I think I'm going to finish for today. And if you have any questions or comments, then um, now is a good time to ask. Dana, yes. Oh. Dana, you have, do you have to unmute yourself? Yes. Yes, yes. Now that was very interesting. Thank you. There is one thing about Chanda that um, I don't feel there is enough information to uh, assume that she had a very mundane view of things, you know, when she um, wanted to ordain. I mean, she must have been um, worn out of living, you know. So I feel that because the story ends actually with her saying that she attained the high stage. Um, my feeling is that she already must have been inclined that way. And she, the first thing, I guess she was starving, that she saw a nun getting food. But it doesn't, in my mind, it doesn't really mean that that's what that was her main motivation. Mm. Anyway, that's. That's what I feel personally, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, I, I can share the poem again so we can have a look at it. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, you're, you're referring to this poem here. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, she says like she, she was, um, went begging, she was wondering for seven years. Uh, she saw a nun, she saw how the nun received food and drink and then she said, sent me forth to a homelessness. So, of course, like we cannot be sure. And I mean, yeah. this is all interpretation, right? But yeah. because she was wondering for seven years, I mean, that must have meant that she theoretically would have had the opportunity to go forth uh, throughout all those seven years if she wanted to, since she doesn't have family anymore. So there's nobody to hold her back, no husband or no parents to prevent her from actually going forth if she wants to. But because yeah. the poem says that, when she sees that someone else receives food, then only she goes forth. Um, I personally feel that probably that was her motivation. But I mean, clearly, I mean, for somebody who deeply um, sees the suffering of life, it's not that difficult to then develop a genuine spiritual motivation and to, um, to uh, you know, to make that, to understand the Dhamma and make progress on the path. So maybe everything came together at some point. Yeah, sure. Now, I wonder, you know, what was the condition there that um, if someone like her would wander the countryside, whether she would come across the um, Buddhist nuns or maybe that was the first time she actually, I wonder. I mean, seven years, you would think that she would come across the, uh, across the monastics, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Mm. But what you're suggesting is yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good, yeah. Oh. Trayton? Um, thanks for this. I really liked it a lot. Um, I had a question when they say in the uh, in the poems when they say that they've mastered the three knowledges, what are they specifically referring to? Um so in Pali, this is called the Tevija. So these are three standard knowledges. Uh, and the first one is called the, um, the recollection of past lives. So they are able to um, remember all the past lives throughout, like, like many past lives. The, 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 the stock phrase says that they remember throughout many eons of universes expanding and collapsing and, and so on. So not only one or two, but really a lot of past lives. Uh, with all the details, uh, so they understand about the enormity of, of samsara and um, yeah, the, the, just the, the, the futile nature of, of continuing in this uh, round of rebirth. Um, and the second one is the divine eye, so the ability to see beings um, passing away and reappearing, so how beings um, get reborn according to karma. Um, and the third one is the attainment of arahanship. So they see the destruction of the taints and then realize that the full enlightenment. Julian? You didn't have a question. You, I, I thought. I'm sorry, I was waving my arm in a random fashion. Uh, okay, no problem. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Sorry, you have to unmute yourself. Oh yeah. Hi, Cindy. Hi. Thank you very much uh, for for that. That's uh, very interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask. Uh, so Patachar's um, life story was so was um, like the details of some of that. Where where was that mainly from? She didn't write any um, uh, poems about that herself. Mm. Um, I gathered, yeah, one of the other uh, nuns wrote a bit about that. Is that where we know about her life story or is there more commentary or something mm. like that where we so, get that from? Yeah, so the earliest version is uh, from, from the early text. The earliest uh, bit is the poem of Kisa Gotami that I showed just now. Mm. And then we obviously have her, her, her apadana, and I've shortened her apadana very much. I only showed you the two stanzas that talk about her being the foremost nun, uh, how she attained that. But there is a, a lot more in her apadana. It's much, much longer. I just couldn't go through everything today. Um, so in her apadana, um, it's put into her own mouth, but apadanas are much later literature. So um, Clearly, there was a memory that goes back to at the time when Kisa Gutami made her poem. So I think that story is actually accurate because uh, we have an early testimony from Kisa Gutami that tells the story in brief. And then her Apadana tells it in more detail. And then in the Dhammapada commentary, there's also a very extensive um, form of her story that also goes into a lot of detail. So um, over, the t over time, the story got a little bit more elaborate. But I think the main details are already mentioned in Kisa Gutemi's poem. So it's, it's probably uh, fairly accurate, I think. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Anna Marie? It's not really a question, it's, it's just a comment. But thank you for, for, well, everything, but also for laying out the poems like next to each other it made me smile a bit because um like how the other nuns were influenced or were using Patachara's words and um like nowadays there's well-respected teachers that um whose stories and ways of teaching get repeated a lot by mm -hmm. their disciples so it just makes it relatable so it was nice thank you yeah yeah, it's a very good teaching device. And I think um, because when teachers are very respected, we have this emotional connection to them. 
So if we repeat, if, if the students repeat the stories, then people, it's much easier for people to, to get a, a connection and to listen more. And once you have an emotional connection, um, it's, it's much easier to bring difficult points of summer across because um, people have this positive mindset. And um, I think it's a very skillful way of, of, of doing that. Um, and obviously it goes back to an early time already. I think Julian now really has a question. <laughs> has a hand up. <laughs> um, one thing um, that hasn't been mentioned is in the story of Patachara's awakening, it said in a couple of the poems in the first watch of the night and the second watch of the night and the third watch of the night. Yeah. And that's to echo the summaries of what happened to the Lord Buddha at yeah. the time of his awakening. Mm. And I was sort of thinking it's interesting how bits of text, and I mean, we see it in the suttas, you know, bits of text are sort of here and there and elsewhere in the jigsaw. Mm. Um, so it makes it sort of harder to know. It's almost like a formula for she had some really excellent meditation in a way, um, which unites her with the tradition. But at the same time, um, we see less of a personality of an individual woman. So it's, you know, it sort of has a strength and a disappointment in it, I think. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes people assume because some poems are similar that uh, they aren't well preserved and they forgot somebody's poem and um, copied someone else's. Um, I, that is the reason why I laid them out next to each other like this, because I think mm -hmm. we can see small variances. Uh, so mm -hmm. they aren't exactly the same. So I think people are playing around with each other's poem. And I think people are paying respect to each other by in incorporating bits and pieces from other people's poem. I don't think that's necessarily a sign that the poems were corrupted or that the poems, um, yeah. uh, that, that we lost anything. I think this is really, uh, could, could, could very well be original and could very well be intended. Um, and I, I think this is also a way, again, to, to evoke um, an emotional response from the listeners. If you make, like, if you say your own enlightenment was exactly the same way as the Buddha's, um, then, of course, I mean, people might be more, more um, like, have, first of all, have an emotional connection or also think more that this is an authentic, an, an authentic statement. And so it's a way of, of saying, like, um, of, of showing that this is actually true enlightenment and not just some, some other fake thing because you went through exactly the same process as the Buddha went through. So yeah. it, it could also be a skillful, skillful way of, of, um, of stating one's yeah. enlightenment. I think, it, I think it makes the text rich. For me, it makes the text richer overall. Mm. But it's just such a long time ago, away, ago that mm. there's just no way that scholars can go back and look for surrounding evidence of, you know, which might have happened in which situation, which, mm. whereas, you know, if it was a medieval document, we'd have lots of things to be comparing it with and mm. it would be different. Yeah, yeah we, don't, we don't have much, but at, at least we have a little bit, I think. that That's actually the, also one of the, the things I want to show with this course, that we do have a little bit. And we have mm -hmm. enough to, to be inspired and to, to piece at least a few things together and to show uh, how developments evolve over, like over periods of time, over centuries. Um, so if we only look at one nun, then it's very difficult because that could be an outlier. Mm -hmm. But if you look at yeah. the stories of many nuns over the historical strata of texts, then I think we can see tendencies. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think mm -hmm. we do have quite a bit of material to draw a few conclusions. That, um, that text of which there is only the French translation, mm. what is it again, please? It's called the Avadana Shataka. Uh, could you put that in the chat? Uh, yes. Um, so that's a, a Sanskrit original. Right. Uh -huh. Ah, oh, thank you. And people assume that this was written, I think, around the second century CE. 
Uh, and it probably belongs to the Mula Savasivada tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Avadana Sataka, like Sataka means 100. So um, it's a collection of 100 Avadana stories and 10 of those stories are the stories of nuns. Yeah, and Avadana, for, Avadana. Yeah, yeah, Avadana is the Sanskrit word for Pali Avadana. And mm -hmm. in four of the 10 stories of the nuns, then there is a nun that is a foremost nun, foremost in a certain quality. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and do you have, sorry, go do ahead. Do you have the address, do you have the address for the PDF of the translation? Um, a hand or, or a name that would help me find it easily? Uh, it's really, really difficult to find. Even when I knew yeah, that it existed, it took me so long to find it. It's better that I send it to you by email. Cause it's- Okay, uh, thank yeah. you very much. Thanks a lot. So the translator is, him. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah, but still, it's it's going to be very difficult to find. But I will email it to you if you're interested. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Then I think we can finish for today. As usual, we will finish with uh, three sadhus. Please feel free to join me if you want to. Sadu, sadu, sadu. See you all next time.